Hey, good morning. I'm sure glad that you're here today. And you know, you think about the lyrics of that song, of Tom Petty's song in 1989. It sort of really sort of relates about where we are in our world right now, of all the craziness that's been going on that I won't back down. Although that I will stand at the gates of hell, I won't back down. What an, I mean, sort of an encouragement to us. And then he goes on to say that I'll keep this work from dragging me down and I won't back down. And you think about everything that we have seen just of late. In London where people go to a concert and a guy walks in to shoot people in that concert and over 20 people are killed and over 100 injured. Three hurricanes where 120 people's lives are taken. Two earthquakes in Mexico, almost 500 people killed and over 6,000 injured. And the fact that a crazy person walks into a church a few weeks ago, takes the life of a person and there's several injured. And then, and then the tragedy of what takes place in Las Vegas just last week. And then the media's not reporting this one, but then you got today because it's just a category one that the city of Mobile, Alabama, downtown is underwater. You think about everything that's going on in our nation. And we say, I won't back down. And we look at all that and we go, where, where is God in all this? How in the world do, how do we relate to this? What do we say about this? Why wouldn't God, why would God allow it to happen? Why does he allow some things and not some things? And okay, you say God's sovereign, he knows everything. So then why would he not keep the bad things from happening in our life? Now everything I mentioned, that's sort of a disasters of tragedies that have taken place in our country. But that doesn't even include the things that you're dealing with. There's some things you're dealing with right now that you, you can see it coming. Maybe you've got a friend or a family member, and there's some events coming their way. And, man, you see it coming, you're going, this is not good. This is not going to end well. Or maybe you're at a point right now that's in your own life, that there's maybe a sickness, and you're going, I'm not really sure what's really going to happen here. But I tell you what, I just don't like the way everything is, is looking right now. So where, where is God in all this? Well, the goal today is to give a biblical perspective to the tragedies in, in our world. And I'm going to be in Romans chapter 1, and we're going to start uh, with verse 21 here in just a moment. But what does God say to us? What's the challenge for us? What's the encouragement for us? What do we need to be doing with our own lives? So Romans chapter 1, starting with verse 21. Can I ask you to stand with me as we read in reverence to the Word of God? Thank you for standing. It says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. So the three biblical perspectives I want to give you, and let me encourage you. Man, take some notes. Because as guys, you just work through the text today, you're going to see some things that God is going to say to you. So let me challenge you and encourage you to do that. Pray with me. God, thanks for today. I thank you for everybody that's here. And God, I know there's people that, a lot of our people are traveling on vacation. And I pray, God, that you would give them a great time to be together. I pray, God, that they could have a family altar time where they get together and be um, Lord, they would be intentional about talking about spiritual things. God, that they would spend time praying together. And God, I, I pray, God, that today as we work our way through the text, I pray, God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be found acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, our strength, our Redeemer, and our soon-coming King. In Jesus' name, and everybody says, amen. Have a seat, would you? So let me give you the first biblical perspective is our thinking leads to darkness. Now, it started in the garden, in the Garden of Eden, where there were two people, Adam and Eve. And when they showed up, is that God breathed life into them. Now, everything was based on truth. The truth was a relationship. And the relationship was with God. Now, understand, God didn't have to even give them a relationship with himself. He did that simply because of his own grace. But you see, when he gave them that revelation that I'm going to have a relationship with you. He had a rule. Now, the, rule, the reason he had the rule was it was not to 
rain on their parade, but the reason he gave them a rule was, he said, I know what's best for you. Now, here's what I need you to do. Every tree that you see, you can have that one, but there's one tree. Don't touch it. Do not touch it. And they did exactly what you and I would have done. They went and ate the, the fruit from the tree. And when they did that, rebellion is born. Rejection of God is born. And when that takes place and the enemy comes in, you see, deception takes place because of what they chose to do. Well, in the same way, we don't honor God because we want to be our own God. We don't really want, we want the blessings of God. We want the things that God brings to us, but we really don't want to submit to what God has for us. And over in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, we'll look at that verse again. It says, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking. Now, if you've got a copy of God's word on your outline, man, I would encourage you, circle that word. Because it is really important and we're going to talk about that. It says, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. The word thinking, it means dialogue. It means, it refers to the working uh, now, don't miss this. It, wor- it means the working of the human mind apart from the biblical revelation of God. So, in other words, it's, it's how we reason it out ourselves. In this dialogue, what we do is that we reject God's revelation and we re- reject God's standard of absolute truth. Now, there's a lot of reasons that maybe some of you, maybe in our world, that people reject the standard of God. That we reject God, but, you know, the thing that you continue to hear is that, well, God's outdated. He, it doesn't work. He, the Word of God, it doesn't work anymore because it's just so outdated. You know, it's like that we're up to date and God's out of date, you know. Because we're up to date, we know what's best. So, see, we want to be our own God. We want to, we want to honor ourselves. So, what happens is humans are left to be our own mental devices and we are inadequate for discovering what reality really is about. And, and then it goes on to say in the Scripture, for although they knew God... They neither glorified him nor gave thanks to him. You see, you can know some things about God. You can know some facts about God, but that doesn't mean that you know God. And because when you say that, that you know some, and it might be you know some deep truths about God. But the question is, do you know him personally? Because, see, the problem is this. Whether you are a Christ follower or not a Christ follower, the problem is you got to ask yourself, what is my standard of truth? Because with most people that call themselves Christ followers, they don't have an absolute, there's not an absolute standard of truth in their life, unless it's themselves. It's you're not the revelation of God. And so ask yourself that question. And, and you know, when something like this takes place of what we saw in Las Vegas, we step back and we just go, man, how senseless. Josh, our worship, uh, our worship pastor was, he was telling the story, he was telling us the story about, he was talking to his dad. And when I heard the story, I thought, man, I'm going to steal that. Now, I'm going to give Ken credit. Now, you see, you understand, that's what pastors usually do. They just steal everybody else's stuff, all right? And so you sit up and you go, oh, my gosh, feel so smart. Well, not really. I just steal everybody else's stuff, all right? And sometimes I give credit and sometimes I don't give credit. But I'm going to give Ken credit for this one because it's really good. When Josh asked him, he said, Ken, could we not, I mean, could we not do something to pass a bill or do something to curb all the violence that's going on? And Ken said, well, There is a rule. It was written a long time ago. The rule is, thou shalt not commit murder. But see, what we've done is that we're too smart for God, so we've taken God completely out of our society. And there's no absolute standard of truth for us. And when there's no standard of truth, we choose to live in whatever sin that we want to live in, and it it produces darkness. And see, here's the thing, is that when you think about this, after the election, don't, don't go that, oh, this is a political sermon. This is not a political sermon. This is a truth sermon, all right? So after the election, they surveyed college students. And there's a question they ask. Is it okay, if the election doesn't go your way, is it okay to have a violent demonstration where you can demonstrate violence in that demonstration? Can you do that? Over 60% of college students said it was okay to show violence in a demonstration. So what does that sin lead to? Because see, here's what the enemy's smart enough to know. The enemy's smart enough to know that he will start with one piece of fruit with you. 
And don't, 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 don't think that he's going to leave it there. He's going to continue to add on because, see, that sin won't be enough for us. And so we've got to have more sin. And so, and then we have more sin. Now we have darkness, and it leads to darkness in our life. So where does, it, where does the sin lead to? Because I will promise you that Adam and Eve, when they took the bite of the fruit, they had no idea that we would still be dealing with their rebellion. And don't think for a minute that our sin just affects us. It doesn't. It affects everybody around you. And so when the good news is, is that in our sense of darkness that we have, is that understand today that Jesus came and he came to defeat the darkness. He came that we could, we, could, we could live in light. And so whatever struggle that you have today, whatever tragedy that you've got, you've got going on, I want you to understand that Jesus has defeated what looks like darkness and what could be darkness in your life. Now, hang on with me, okay? Because we're eventually going to get to a point where hopefully we can answer questions for you uh, through the text. So that's the first uh, biblical perspective. Let me give you the second biblical perspective. Our wisdom leads to foolishness. Romans 1.22 says, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. So in, instead of accepting biblical revelation, we become skeptics. And this is so true in today's culture. Is that what do we do is that give me the data and then I will reason it out. And this is what we do because social media has done this to, to us. Is that our world is set up now all we do is complain. You see, social media is set up that all, if you want to complain, just complain all you want to. Complain, complain, and the whole world is complaining. And yet you want to look and go, you know what? If you don't have a solution, then don't complain. And this is the reason that, there's no, that people don't see the solution. They don't know the solution. They don't understand that the biblical revelation from God is a solution because of the gospel that we talked about two weeks ago. That is a solution. And so what we do is that we spend our life complaining because we don't have solutions because we don't want sound biblical counsel. And then it says, they claim to, claim, they claim to be wise, but they became fools. Now, that word fools, it's not just intellectual folly. folly. It's also wickedness as well. So when there's no biblical counsel, then you can live in any sin that you want to live in simply because there's no such thing as sin anymore because we are the standard. The scripture is not the standard. The Bible's not the standard. So we can do whatever we want to because we reject biblical counsel. How much do you hear in the world today about world peace? And, and, and everybody just is screaming, oh, if we could have world peace, that's the goal. We could have world peace. Okay, let me ask a question. How many of you really would say, you know what? I, choose, I want world peace. Raise your hand right now. Raise your hand. Do not, the rest of y'all, y'all don't want that or what? Man, that's like communism there, isn't it? You know? I mean, how long have they been talking in Israel about world peace? How long have they been doing that? Here's what you better understand. There will never be world peace without Jesus. Ever. Ever. And I know that you go, oh, you're a preacher, you're paid to say that, dude. Why would you say that? Because, no, it is the answer for the world. Because, see, we can talk about all we want to. We can talk about, well, you know, if you treat people well, if you love people where they are, you treat people well, everything is going, is going to be okay. And, you know, I used to think, really, I, I'm going to be honest, confession here. I used to think that the people that treated people the best were Christ followers. Oh, can I tell you? Some of the meanest people I've ever met are church people. Now, in the 815 service, the 840 service, I had people going, amen. I said, those people who just say amen, they're the mean people you need to look out for, right? <laughs> so, you see, we, we look at this and, and we think, well, you know what, if we're just nice to people. Well, here's the problem with that. Is that that still doesn't deal with a heart issue. How many times have you heard somebody say, Oh my gosh, I mean, oh, have I, I've heard it when I was in youth ministry. I've heard it, and it's still going on. Trust your heart. Don't ever trust your heart. You know why? The scripture says, above all else, the heart is evil. It is wicked. There's nothing good about your heart. The only thing about your heart that's good, you had nothing to do with it. It was Jesus that came into your life that set you free. That's the only thing good about it. It has nothing to do. 
And that's even a Seattle Seahawks fan that's cheering for me today. See, you see, you wonder if God can redeem? There you go. That's, there it is, all right? Amen, Jonna? So you think, see, the thing is, is that we think that world peace, and oh, just, just have world peace. Listen to me. Unless we have, unless we have a spiritual awakening, if you don't study church history, sometimes you don't hear that word. That means where masses, numbers of people are coming to, to faith in Jesus. Unless that happens, don't miss this. Oh, folks, you hadn't seen the worst yet. The heart is just now being unleashed. It's not going to get any better unless we have an awakening. You know why the church is so important? Because we ought to be the people that are those that are calling out and saying, I've got your answer. His name is Jesus. This is what we don't want to admit to, though. Who are we? This is even hard to say. The God of the universe demonstrated his love for you that when while we were sinners, Christ died for us, and we think that we're all that. Here's what we better understand. The guy that took over 400 lives in the city of Las Vegas, can I tell you something? Jesus loves him just as much as he loves you. You think about that for a minute. You don't think his love is great? You see, but what we do is that we want to reason it all out. And every tragedy in the world today is a byproduct of a man and a woman who chose, who chose to live independently from God. And ever since that, we have kept up the pace of dishonoring God and wanting to be God ourselves. Let me show you a video clip of a guy who wanted to be God himself. I'm a God. You're a God. I'm a God. I'm not the God. I don't think. Because you survived a car wreck? You folks ready to order? I didn't just survive a wreck. I wasn't just blown up yesterday. I have been stabbed, shot, poisoned, frozen, hung, electrocuted, and burned. Oh, really? And every morning I wake up without a scratch on me, not a dent in the fender, I am an immortal. Special today is blueberry waffles. Why are you telling me this? Because I want you to believe in me. You're not a god. You can take my word for it. This is 12 years of Catholic school talking. I could come back if you're not ready. How do you know I'm not a god? <laughs> oh, please. How do you know? Because it's not possible. I'll come back. Doris. This is Doris. Her brother-in-law, Carl, owns this diner. She's worked here since she was 17. More than anything else in her life, she wants to see Paris before she dies. Oh, boy, what I... What are you doing? This is Debbie Kleiser and her fiancé, Fred. Do I know you? They're supposed to be getting married this afternoon, but Debbie is having second thoughts. What? Lovely ring. This is Bill. He's been a waiter for three years since he left Penn State and had to get work. He likes the town, he paints toy soldiers, and he's gay. I am. <laughs> This is Gus. He hates his life here. He wishes he stayed in the Navy. Well, I could have retired on half pay after 20 years. Excuse me. Is this some kind of trick? Well, maybe the real God uses tricks. You know, maybe he's not omnipotent. He's just been around so long. He knows everything. Oh, okay. Well, who's that? This is Tom. He worked in the coal mine until they closed it down. And her? It's Alice. Came over here from Ireland when she was a baby. She lived in Erie most of her life. He's right. And her? Nancy. She works in the dress shop and makes noises like a chipmunk when she gets real excited. Hey! true. How do you know these people? I told you, I know everything. In about five seconds, a waiter's gonna drop a tray of dishes. Five, four, That's three, nuts. two, one. <laughs> How many of you have seen that classic movie? The rest of you have lived in sin. You need to watch that movie. Rent that, rent the movie. Go, it is a good movie. You see, none of us are that crazy to go, oh, we're God. We, we wouldn't be that crazy. But boy, we sure live our life like we're our, our own God, don't we? Let me give you the third biblical perspective. Is our substitution leads to idols. It says, in, the, in exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like an immortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. See, we do exactly what the Romans did. We substituted worship for religion. 
All you parents, let me, can I have your attention for just a moment? Parents of small kids and teenagers. And we talked about this in the first, very first week. Derry taught on the Saturday night. I did Sunday, but it was from Romans 116 about the power of the gospel. You know, the hardest thing to do, and this, parents, I want you to listen to me, okay? This is what we do as parents, is that we want to think the best of our kids. And we don't really deal a lot of times with their own sin. So if you've got a kid who's just selfish, got an attitude all the time, we excuse that. And we excuse that because we don't want to talk about does the gospel really affect their life? They have all these rights. You know, and we want to blame teenagers. That's not a teenager deal. That's a parent deal. That's a leadership deal. I know. I've raised them. And so I, I understand how this works. And so see, what happens is, is that we, we, use, we use Christianity a lot of times just as a religion, not as a relationship that ought to be changing somebody's life. And you see, we substitute worship for religion. And understand today is that we're all created to worship something. You came out of the womb and you were, there was a longing in your life and you, you, were, you were created to worship something. You were, you were created to be passionate about something. Let me ask it to you this way. When you get up in the morning, what is it that drives you? Because whatever drives you, that's probably the thing that you're worshiping. That's probably the idolatry in your life. And so no matter what you do, and, and you might not be a morning person, but when you get up and you get started, there's ought to be something in you that clicks and goes, you know what? The thing that I want to do more than anything today is I want to honor God where he has placed me in business. And see, we get so, we get so caught up in God. I, most of the people that you talk to, they don't like their job. They hate their job. I wonder if we would look at our job and say, I, I really, I'm going to work because God's called me there and I'm there to honor God and I want people to see in my life that I don't worship idols. Maybe you don't say it that way, but I get up in the morning because I want to honor God and I want people to see Christ in me. Christ in you is the hope of glory. And you see, when we look at this, is that, We've replaced the standard of truth in our life for idols itself. So let me ask you, what are, what are your idols today? For some of you, sex is your idol. Sex in your marriage is your idol. I know some of you men right now could be real candid with you. You're going, that ain't true in mine because my wife never wants to have that, all right? So that's what you're saying. I know you're going, dude, I can't believe you just said that in church, all right? If you don't say it in church, what do you say, right? Amen? Can I get an Amen. Thank you. All right. So anyway, you know, and so some of you, you know, what happens is that some of you men, you're using sex in your marriage as an idol. You're using it as a pressure point for your wife to have to produce. You know why? Because the pornography is not enough for you. There's some of you that politics is your idol. You really think who you vote for is going to solve our world's problem. It ain't got anything to do with who's in office. It has to do if we are going to decide that, you know what, the thing that's going to drive my life is Jesus himself. That's it. For some of you, your kids are your idols. Well, let me give you a great illustration that happened to me this past week. At 11 o'clock, we show up in here with our staff and we're praying. And that was a time that Mary Dowdy and Christine Hampton both had girls that were on the mission trip. And they were on that mission trip, and that's when they just found out that the weather wasn't cooperating. They didn't know if they were going to get to come home on Friday or Saturday when they thought they were going to get to come home. They thought they were going to have to wait. I mean, there was floods. There was mudslides. And so I looked at Mary, and I said, Mary, are you, are you okay? And she said, well, you know, I was a little bit shocked at first because I think they're in great hands, and what can I do about it? I'm, I'm, I'm good. She's right where she needs to be. I looked at Elizabeth and I said, Elizabeth, are you okay? She said, well, number one, I'm not a worrier. But number two, I'll tell you that what's the worst thing that can happen? Is my child done make it home that God calls my child home? What an incredible legacy for my daughter to leave that the last thing she was doing was serving somebody on a mission trip. That would be two moms that don't worship their kids. 
You know what some of you parents are done? You, build, you live your life in front of your kids and you build in fear to your kids' lives. That's the reason they'll never go on a mission trip. That's the reason they'll never ever go out and live for Jesus because you coddle them so much that you don't want them to do that because you would rather control their life. Be honest. You'd rather control their life than Jesus control their life. And you teach them to live in fear. And that is not of God. God wants your kids to be unleashed. And he wants them to understand that the Christian life is not something that is safe. It is very dangerous. But we don't want to do that. We'd rather set up idols in our home. Oh, these are my kids. I got pictures all over my house of my kids. I'm going to tell you. Your kids, if you know this, they ain't yours. God loaned them to you. I know some of you right now will go, if he loaned them, can I just give them back? (laughs) The best thing you can do is just turn them over to Jesus and go, you know what? I'm done. Don't enable your kids to live in fear. So we live our life either with revelation from God or rejection of God. See, we struggle with these tragedies in our life that we face because of something that happened. But I want you to know that you, you ask, okay, why, why, why do things happen? Man, I, I have no idea why a crazy man would go to Las Vegas and open fire at a country music venue. I, I don't know. But this is what I do know is that I have watched people, and I have no idea how people do this. I've watched a mom and a dad and a daughter at the other daughter's funeral. I mean, their shell, her her shell was in this casket. She wasn't there. Her shell was. And in the last song, I see a mom and a dad and the other daughter lead in worship. And as this girl's saying, how does a mom and dad and a daughter stand up and lift their hands to the Lord and surrender? How do you do that? How, does, how, do, you, how do you be a lady there in Las Vegas and when the shooting happens, a, a man is... Jumps on top of his wife to protect her and she feels the bullets going in him as he protects her. I have no idea. And I have no idea why that had to take place. But I want you to know this. That in the midst of the tragedies that we face in life, God's given us some promises that we need to hold on to. So in John 16, 33... As I wrap up my time with you, he's given us a goal, and then he's given us two promises. One we don't like, one we love. Here is the goal. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. That's the goal in everything. Don't pray for happiness. That's a fleeting thing. It'll come and go. That's an emotion. Pray for peace in the midst of the tragedies that you have in your life. He says, I've told you these things so that So that in me, you may have peace. There's a goal. Now, here's a promise. In this world, you will have trouble. We don't like that one very much. We don't like that one at all. But he's looking at his disciples, and he didn't say this, but he's he's looking at his disciples. He says, you know what? Here's here's the deal. He said, guys, I want you to understand that you're going to have trouble. Now, all of you, can you imagine? All if What if he had told them at the very beginning when he said, hey, boys, follow me. Oh, and by the way, when you follow me... Every one of you are going to die for your faith but one, and you're going to be put on an island in seclusion. How many would have stepped up and gone, oh, I'm in. That's me. I'm not sure I'd have wanted to do that. I mean, because what would we do? What's in it for me? This is what's in it for you. I will give you peace. And in this world, you're going to have trouble. You know why we're going to have trouble? We're simply going to have trouble because we live in a fallen world. It started with Adam and Eve, and it's just continued on. And so that's the reason that we're, we, we live in this world, while, and we don't understand why God doesn't stop all the tragedies. There's a lot of tragedies that we don't even know about that he has stopped that we'll, we'll never know about. But he says, in this world, you're going to have trouble as a result of sin, and because it's just called life, it's going to happen here. 
And there's some things going on with you today that I have no idea what's going on. And man, you're facing some tragic things in your life. And I wish I could look at you and go, I know that God's going to deliver you. And I promise you that one day God is going to, to deliver you. But right now it might not work out like everybody's telling you it's going to work out. But then the next thing he says is this. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Ultimately, God will call all evil to stop. That will happen when he calls you home or when Jesus comes back. Whichever happens first. And he'll call all evil to stop. And understand today that no matter what you got, that the king of the universe sent his son Jesus to die and to take all of our sin. And when he did that, he allowed us to have a relationship with him through the person of the Holy Spirit. So that you and I, so we could have peace in our life. But understand this, that this is what God's called us to do now. That we're to be the sellers of hope. We're to be those who are giving hope to other people. It doesn't, and let me tell you, when people go through some kind of tragic event, they don't need some theological point from you. They need somebody that will cry with them, that will hurt with them, that will mourn with them, that will just be present in their life. That's what they want. And that's what God's called us to do. To share with them about the hope that you have. In 1870, a man by the name of Horatio Spafford who lived in Chicago with his wife Anna and their five kids. Their son Horatio Jr. passed away when he was four years old because he contacted scarlet fever and they knew that they were going to lose him, and they did. He passed away. Not long after that, the great fire of Chicago set in, and he lost all of his real estate investment as well as his entire savings. So he thought it would be a great idea to get his family away from Chicago. So he decided that he and Ann and the kids and the four girls were going to get on a ship. They were going to go to England and get away from Chicago, and there... They were going to assist D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, in one of his crusades in England. But when they were going to board the ship, a last-minute business deal came up. And he encouraged Anna and the girls. He said, go ahead and go. I will meet up with you. And so Anna and the girls, they boarded the French steamship, the Ville du Havre. And several days later, he got the news that the Ville du Havre was, was struck by an iron selling vessel from England. And when it struck it, the Ville du Havre sunk in 12 minutes, claiming 226 lives. It was the worst naval disaster until the Titanic, which happened 40 years later. And Horatio Spafford got a telegram from his wife a few days later and had two words. Survived alone. So a few days later, he gets on a ship out of New York City to go meet up with his wife, Anna. And there where he was on that ship, there came a point that the captain called him to the bridge and said, Mr. Spafford, I believe that we're going over the very point right now where the Ville du Havre sunk. And Horatio Spafford, looking out into the watery grave that claimed his four daughters' lives, he penned the words of an incredible hymn that has been sung through the ages. It is well with my soul. So if you're Horatio and you've lost everything but your wife what do you do? How does a man do that? Because he knew where his hope lied. That's why through the tragedies he knew he understood would you stand with us? 
Father God, we pray that in the name of Jesus that people today would be encouraged that through everything in their life, through everything going on in our country, that Jesus, you are still the source of peace. And that you came to give peace. And as we sang this song, as we sing this song, that this one man penned when he had lost everything but his wife, I pray that we would understand the depths of your love for us and that you never leave us. And God, that you have an eternity in a place called heaven waiting for us. But when we come to the point that we surrender our life to you, Jesus. So as we sing to you, God, I pray that our hearts are encouraged in Jesus' name.